Welcome to Tennis 2020 Real Talk. I'm Dewey Evans. I uh, want to start, this broadcast is made possible um, as a service to you, the community, the tennis community, by Austin Tennis Academy and EKH Media. This is the first of these Real Talk conversations that we're having. Uh, you know, we often think that we're alone. And in times like this, when we're going through social distancing, it becomes even more exacerbated. So what we're doing here is trying to provide you with great information, letting you know that you're not alone, letting you know the solutions that people are finding other places or the challenges that people are facing other places so that we as a community can help each other um, navigate this world, which probably won't be the same for any time in the near future. Today, talking to someone who has his finger on the pulse of things worldwide, probably more than most, Mark Tennant, uh, co-founder and director of Inspire to Coach. And Mark's program is the largest provider of programs and coach education in the UK. And he also consults and works with international federations, so those tennis federations around the world, um, and helping them navigate tennis. Welcome, Mark, how are you doing? I'm very well, thank you. Great to be your, your first uh, your first guest. Well, it's nobody nobody better, right? Um, can you tell us about how things are in the tennis world specifically, in the UK, and you know maybe what you've seen other places? Uh, well, as you said, we're we're living in in strange times. Um, in the UK, uh, it's almost like it's what people referred to before the Second World War as the phony war. Um, we all know that something's happening. We know that it's not good, but we don't quite know what's happening or when yet. Um, so as things currently stand, uh, tennis clubs are open and tennis is carrying on pretty much as normal. Um, however, we know that there are daily briefings from the government which is advising sports governing bodies and corporations, including the World Tennis Association in the UK. And uh, so we're kind of playing a waiting game at the moment, almost expecting that there's going to be some instruction or guidance that sporting activities uh, in clubs uh, around the UK are going to close. Um, the LTA has already suspended some activities uh, involving its own staff and uh, we're kind of expecting that there's going to be a next inevitable step, which is that there will be strong advice uh, to members' clubs as well. Um, pretty much all other professional sport in the UK has stopped now and has done for a little while. Um, so football, what you call soccer and rugby and uh, athletics and pretty much all, all the main sports have stopped. And um, I guess it's just a question of time before tennis does the same. How many clubs is your organization responsible for operating at this point in time? Around the UK, we run 38 different um, clubs or tennis facilities. Most of them are traditional tennis clubs. Some of them are indoor private members clubs and some of them are park sites, but it's a total of 38 altogether around the UK. And I gathering what you're saying is you are open is all regular programming going on at those facilities at this point in time or have you cut back on programming we're just starting we had a um a management meeting this morning and we're just starting to cut back on a few things but as of as of 2 20 p.m uk time everything is running normally uh, schools in the uk are still open and uh, everything is running normally we are starting to take some special measures. We've stopped cardio tennis as of today, uh, simply because that tends to involve slightly larger groups and more equipment, which will uh, avoid transmission of any uh, of any virus through that equipment. So we've stopped cardio with immediate effect. Um, we are putting restrictions on access to clubhouses. Um, a lot of our tennis is played outside, so. We, we feel and the government advises that, that things transmit more easily in still air and inside rather than outside. So um, we, we are restricting access to indoor clubhouses. Um, 
And apart from that, we're just asking uh, parents, children, and of course our coaches to take the usual steps with their personal hygiene and, and making sure that they're vigilant to any uh, sudden illness um, and, and that we take the, the appropriate action. We're kind of in a, a bit of a waiting game. Um, I suspect that we're going to have to tighten measures further in due course, but that's the current situation. So social distancing is the term of the moment where, you know, in the United States, basically the guidance at the moment is getting to where groups are less than 10 people that you want to have a minimum of six feet be distance between people. Um, you know, I think wisdom has come out which says wearing masks makes absolutely no sense in terms of trying to prevent um, catching the disease. But if you have the disease and you are forced to not be able to be isolated, that that is a way to potentially keep yourself from spreading it. So that if you, you know, you feel like you're sick, you haven't been diagnosed, you're not sure, possibly wearing a mask to keep that. And I don't think that that's necessarily going to impact tennis people. But I think the, the scary part is the, you know, up to seven plus days of incubation period where people show absolutely no symptoms um, before they, you know, and, and are contagious during that period of time. Is there a group that I know that you say the LTA is you're waiting to possibly provide guidance, um, but have you had access to anybody who talks about transmission um, through, and I guess the one that I think about the most is tennis balls, right? So I wipe my nose, I grab a tennis ball, um, yeah. and then the virus is on that. Has there been any discussion about that? Um, there's been, there's been uh, a lot of, there have been a lot of questions. I saw something on Facebook just yesterday from a coach asking if anybody knew what happened as far as the virus and tennis balls is concerned. Uh, we haven't had any formal guidance and I haven't been aware of any, there's been a lot of hot air and a lot of questions and a lot of uh, people who are expressing concerns and their opinions, but um, you know, you're always going to get that in this situation. Um, what we haven't got are any facts. Um, and at the moment, everybody is just doing what we know factually to be the right to which we get from the government, from the National Health Service an organization we have public health england so at the moment we're just taking our guidance from that and logically sort of extending that to a tennis environment by making sure that people are washing their hands regularly uh washing tennis equipment um we're making sure for example that if any water bottles or drinks bottles are left lying around after a lesson they get discarded immediately uh we've obviously stopped any physical contact uh so there's no handshaking and high-fiving and that type of stuff uh, we are recommending that people stay two racket lengths away just to do a tennis plant on the six foot thing that you were talking about. But um, we're just extending the, 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 the general advice to the population uh, and, and turning that into slightly more tennis related advice. Um, but that's all we can do at the moment because I think the health professionals have got far more on their plate to worry about whether tennis balls are contagious and we have to just, I think, the right thing. I, I agree. So, you know, I hate to be too lighthearted, but I, I coach double some, right? And so that the take on doubles is to be tethered so that when you move, you know, your partner moves along with you. Um, I think the piece of that that doesn't get talked about enough because people think about of it like a rope um, but it's to not let that rope go slack so that as you know you move that the other person yeah. also moves away with you um, so maybe it's a chance to help people learn a little bit about doubles right so we, we can talk about it in tennis terms um, yeah. you know because everything can't be so absolutely serious right for most of us life is going on we're trying to figure out ways to best kind of deal with it but you know it'd be pretty bad if the entire society became very dour and frowny I, and I, I agree 
I agree. I mean, the the um, for all the intended benefits of social distancing, there's also there's also other effects which are more negative in terms of social interaction, in terms of uh, health benefits and exercise, and and people's general well-being. You know, in terms of being isolated, and um, you know, it would be great. If we could balance out, obviously making sure that people are safe and well and healthy, but actually finding a way that we can still provide support and activity as a real positive sort of antidote to some of what feels like a pretty miserable time at the moment. But but inevitably, sport means that you're bringing people together, and then that's where the problems are created. So, if we can find a way of balancing out government guidelines and, and health advice. With, with being able to deliver sport in a in a slightly less traditional way or a slightly more creative way, um, it would be great if we could find that balance. But um, I think at the moment everybody is still trying to understand what the questions are, let alone the answers. And you know, depending on how long this thing lasts, it may be that over the next few weeks we start to see people come up with solutions that think, "Oh, why didn't I think of that? That's a really good idea." And actually, that is something. Balance out what we do in terms of responsibilities with people's health. So perhaps being able to maintain some level of social contact or, or exercise. Um, at the moment, we don't really know what some of the guidelines and requirements are, and until that happens, I think we just have to assume that we have to try, uh, as you say, socially distance ourselves from each other. Okay, so I have two questions. One very micro and personal right this this is everything is individual and then one very macro so i'm going to ask right. you both and you can pick which one you want to talk about or neither one issue on a very micro scale um you are a dad right you have a 15 year old son and how do you look at this as an opportunity um for how you you know interacting with him and having a shared experience and things like that um, and on a big macro scale, you are someone who interacts with international federations. And has there been any talk that you've heard from other places of how they're handling things? Okay, well, maybe if I, can I flip them around and go the other way and go macro first? Yeah. Um, so, um, ironically, the reason I'm free to be able to speak to you uh, today is because um, I was, I'm supposed to be in Egypt this week. Uh, we have a, a project that we were kickstarting on Monday, uh, yesterday, and uh, that got cancelled at very short notice because of the virus. So, um, you know, on a macro scale, uh, pretty much uh, all international travel now is being is being stopped uh, within the EU. Um, although, although because of Brexit, technically we're coming out of the EU, we're still a member until, or well, we still have member rights until the end of this year. Uh, so we're still part of the EU, and they are they are closing borders rapidly, and many countries are stopping flights now. So all all international work um, face to face is going to stop. Um, I've had quite a few conversations and discussions with colleagues and, and customers and clients overseas, and we're trying to maintain contact and, and do what we can. But but, but on a macro scale, um, anything internationally at the moment is is stopped for the foreseeable future. Uh, so that one's that one's easy. Uh, in terms of my responsibilities as a dad, well, um, at the moment things are carrying on as normal. He's at school at the moment. Um, how long that will last, we'll wait and see. Um, he lives. I'm I'm divorced, um, but he lives with me most of the time when I'm not abroad or away somewhere. So, um, you know, my my evenings with him are pretty much normal. Um, I'm reminding him constantly or asking him how many times has he washed his hands and is he and I get a usual page answer from him. Um, but, but, but life is carrying on pretty much as normal within our household. So, um, yeah, it comes up in conversation, but at the same time, it's actually nice to be able to talk about other stuff. Because I'm sure like a lot of people, although it's important and it's going to be significant for everyone's lives, it's really quite nice to be able to talk about other stuff. Oh. You're operating on a scale beyond which I've ever, you know, probably even contemplated 
doing things both you're doing things internationally you have you know over 30 facilities that you're responsible for i think some of what's going to happen right now is we're going to shake out the people that can't innovate that have just maybe been in a good position got lucky and we're going to have to find ways to do things a little bit differently than how we've always done them. The world isn't the same as what it's been. It's probably not going to go back to the same. Um, I, I am sure we have no idea how it's going to change over the next bit of time. Um, how do you have any innovative ideas on things? You know, one of the things that I think right away is I'm dealing in this technological platform and geez, man, I've been looking for ways to connect with Mark again and to do some things together. And, you know, maybe here's an opportunity to do some coach education things that get all the way to the U.S. or something like that. You know, what are your thoughts on what we can do to keep things moving while we're somewhat isolated? Um. I feel bad for saying this, but we have a phrase in England that walls have ears. So I'm very aware of the fact that, you know, hopefully people, lots of people are watching and listening to this. So if you'll excuse me, I'll keep some of my answers fairly broad because we do have a few ideas. We also need to maintain the edge with certain things. Um, I, hope, I, hope, I hope that's respected, even though some people might grumble at me saying that. Um, I think one of the challenges is the fact that we, we just don't know where we are in terms of the curve. We all kind of think we're at the bottom of a, quite a steep upward curve and that things are going to get worse before they get better. But we have, we've had relatively little time to prepare for this and to innovate. And I, I actually don't think the problem is contact and communication, um, as, as, as this proves. I think the challenge is how we can continue to earn money. Um, and whether it's self-employed coaches or whether it's clubs that rely on income or whether it's other businesses, um, most businesses will start running out of money pretty soon if they don't innovate and find very quick ways of, of replacing lost income. And I think that's the challenge. Um, now, as I, as I said earlier, um, some of that, I suppose, depends on exactly what the guidelines are from government and federations in terms of what is or what isn't allowed. Um, I suspect, and in fact, you're already seeing quite a few coaches on Facebook starting to advertise uh, their websites, and online learning and things like that. Um, and if you're set up already to do that, then it's a natural thing to do to start heavily marketing that. But for a lot of coaches who aren't set up for that type of thing, um, they probably won't be able to set anything up quickly enough to be able to make that work and to generate enough income. Um, I, I, I'm struggling at this stage to give a lot of really credible advice in terms of how to maintain income. Um, other than trying to keep whatever coaching going as, as, as is possible, but I realize that that varies from country to country. Um, I think I think the key thing and one of the things that we're doing is that we would rather issue credit notes and uh, be able to defer things rather than to issue refunds because obviously that has a direct financial impact. Um, mm -hmm. It also depends on the employment status of the staff that you have or whether they're employed, whether they're self-employed. So obviously employees who are having to self-isolate are entitled to sick pay. In, in, when they declare self-isolation, uh, whereas people who are self-employed um, probably won't be able to claim on insurance because it probably won't come under the terms of this sports majeure, which you get in, in standard uh, sort of contracts and, and, and insurance documents. So I guess people are going to start for innovating that, by... For those that don't know what force majeure is, it's essentially act of God. Right, it's a clause within contracts that, and a lot of tennis coaches probably don't know what force majeure is. Um, yeah, but. absolutely. I, I think I think you you may start to see people consulting and sharing ideas, but how how they will be able to charge money and earn money uh, over the internet um, that will be interesting to see. Um, I, I I I think I think for a lot of people who rely on 
their one-to-one -one lessons and their group lessons in clubs um, that uh, things things could get tricky. Could get it's going to be hard. There's there's no doubt about it, and I think we need to all yeah. work together to find yeah. ways to help each other. Um, yeah. And I know the tennis community came together and helped me at a time you know, yeah. not too terribly long ago when things were a little bit rough for me. I want to thank sure. you, Mark, for taking time out of your busy schedule to share with us. Um, you know, if it's OK, I'd love to be able to call on you again as things move along and as you know, we have more specific questions. I'd love to have you back on and sharing with us your insight. Um, if, is that something that you think you might be able to do? I'd be, I'd be very happy to do that. Absolutely. I, it would be a pleasure. So, um, yeah, if, uh, if you need me again, just, just tell me. We definitely, definitely will. And best wishes with everything going on, you know, with over 30 facilities. That's a lot of staff that kind of counting on you to help them solve their problems. Uh, I'm, Having known you now for over a decade, um, I'm glad that they have you because you are someone who truly cares and is innovative and is going to make sure that you do the absolute best you can for those people that are counting on you. Um, and I'm counting on you a little bit too, so thanks for your time. That's really very kind of you, Dewey, and, and uh, best wishes to you and your family and um, to anybody else who's listening and watching as well. Um, and uh, we just have to stick together. We have to try and help each other. We have to try and support each other. Um, I'm happy if I, if I think of any other ideas. You caught me a little bit on the hop, but if I can think of any ideas which I think will genuinely help people to be able to supplement lost income, then I will happily share those ideas. Uh, perhaps other people will do the same too. Well, thank you. and, and Thank you for being first. You know, oftentimes people are worried about what is this going to be? And so thank you so much for being gracious and being the first one on giving us great information and be well, you know, give Joel my best, enjoy your loved ones, be safe. Um, and we will talk to you soon. Thank you very much, Dewey. All the best to you all. This has been Real Talk on Tennis 2020. We will be here throughout this crisis, um, helping you with real talk, with real people and real solutions. Um, I want to thank you. My name is Dewey Evans. We'll talk to you soon.